Good morning, this is Dr. Janice Chu from New York University. I'm reporting here as part of Fits on the Go blog. I'm extremely privileged here to be joined by two cardiologists that need no introduction. To my right, this is Dr. Judy Hockman from New York University. To my left is Dr. Jeffrey Anderson from Utah. And let's actually um, get their take on what's being highlights for them at the meeting. So Dr. Hockman, what are some of the highlights for you at this meeting? Well, there are two trials that I'd like to just briefly mention that I thought were quite striking in terms of the results. The first is the Teresa trial on renolazine. And um, so basically, as expected, renolazine as additive therapy to other antianginals reduced the amount of angina. But what was striking, actually, is the rate of reduction in angina in the placebo group amazingly striking so that you see the run-in period, the level of angina, then the randomization, placebo, renolazine, renolazine superior to placebo. Okay, nice finding as expected, but the curve of placebo, dramatic relief of angina. So as we design trials and we think about quality of life and angina-related quality of life as an endpoint, of course, a lot of our trials are related to revascularization and relief of angina. Remember the placebo effect. Thank you very That's much, Dr. Number Hawkman. One. Number two is TACT, okay? So TACT part one was presented at the AHA, and we were all shocked to see that it looked like chelation reduced the composite of events, death and my stroke and revascularization need. Now we have the other high-dose vitamin arm, two by two factorial design, and we saw that placebo placebo compared to high-dose vitamins with chelation actually reduced events. So we're grappling as a cardiology community with how to deal with this. This is an alternative therapy that we don't understand how it works, we in the mainstream have turned up our nose at this. We've said, these are kooks doing this. And now we actually have to say, okay, we're seeing some treatment effect here. Now, if this had been a new antiplatelet agent, we would have been jumping up and down. Ah, this is the latest, greatest thing. Let's go to the FDA for approval. But since it's this alternative therapy, everybody's like, well, it's got to be chance. You know, we don't understand the mechanism. But let me say something about mechanisms. We so often are misled by surrogate endpoints, biomarkers, intermediate outcomes, that all look great early on in animals where we understand the mechanism, we feel very good intellectually. Then you test it in a big clinical trial, the outcomes are never, well, not never, but often the negative trials. Mm. Here we have the opposite. We have an observation that there's actual improvement in clinical outcomes. And because we don't understand the mechanism, we're very skeptical. Well, let's understand the mechanism and let's continue testing it. Thank you so much for those insights on mechanism and trial designs. And now on to Dr. Anderson. Uh, yes, well, I, th I think those comments by Dr. Hockman are very interesting. And I was just going to ask her, but it only worked in diabetics and those off statins. Is that right? So does that suggest anything? A play of chance? We don't know. But again, some other intriguing uh, questions that these uh, trials raise. I don't think I'm quite ready to jump in yet, but, you know, point well taken. We shouldn't discard it. We need to look into it. Well, uh, I'm not ready to be recommending his routine care. Mind you, I, I, I hope I didn't come across as that, a absolutely. But we need to take this seriously and look at it and investigate it. And subgroups, I'm always, I'm always leery of subgroups. We've been so misled by subgroups. The vast majority are just by chance. Well, one trial sort of on the other opposite side is a therapy we've embraced for decades, niacin. 
And so this was testing the Heart Protection 2 study, the Thrive study, and we al already have a study that raised doubts about that, the AIM High study in the US. So this is a much bigger trial, quote, the definitive trial um, that was managed from Oxford, and it was basically a negative study. In fact, it just caused more adverse effects and no additional efficacy. Um, there are a couple of caveats, though, that these patients were managed extremely well on, on statin and adjunctive therapy to get their LDLs down into what most of us would consider an optimal range of, on the average, I think it was in the 60s. So on top of that, adding on niacin uh, did raise HDL a little bit, did, raise, uh, did lower triglycerides, had a minimal effect on LDL, and in that group of patients, it didn't really add much. So what do we do with niacin? Now my own interpretation is if you get there with uh, LDL reducing therapy, it's not worth adding on niacin. Uh, the, the other issue I have though is what about those that you can't get to that level, uh, that have higher LDLs, maybe higher triglycerides, lower HDLs, sort of the classic metabolic syndrome. And I think we just don't know for sure. So it answered part of the question, but not the whole question. Well, thanks so much for both Dr. Hockman and Dr. Anderson. This has been a tremendous interview, um, taking us from trials to guideline, from discovery to delivery, and thanks for joining us. You can find more details on youtube.com backslash fits on a go. Thank you very much. <music>